All right. Well, buonasera a tutti. Uh, benvenuti. Uh, good, in good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, so my name is Tiziana Cervesato. I'm the director of events um, of the Italian Cultural Center of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And I'm really, really happy to welcome you uh, tonight um, for the second uh, appointment of Il Circolo Letterario. And I'm also very, very happy to welcome again um, Piera Nagaravaso, our curator and presenter uh, for this series. Uh, tonight, Pierana will discuss the life and work of Natalia Ginsburg. And um, before um, I give the floor to Pierana, um, I would like to say a few, um, a few words about uh, um, Pierana. So Pierana Garavaso was born and grew up in Italy. Uh, she came to the US uh, to earn a PhD in philosophy uh, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Uh, she taught philosophy at the University of Minnesota Morris for 34 years. Um, she was awarded the UMN Morris Alumni Association Teaching Award in 2003 the Horace T. Morse Alumni Associate, Association Undergraduate Teaching Award in 2004, and the UMN Morris Faculty Research Award in 2017. Her areas of research include history of analytic philosophy, philosophy of mathematics, and feminist philosophies. She has published articles in Italian and English and authored, co-authored or edited several books. Um, the last collection she has edited is the Bloomsbury Companion to Analytic Feminism in 2018. And as Emerita uh, professor, she plans to devote more time to reading <clears throat> and discussing Italian uh, literature. Um, so I would also like to thank uh, everyone uh, who has made a donation uh, to, to support um, our uh, cultural and educational uh, programs. Thank you so much. Um, stay um, at the end of the presentation. I will draw the winner uh, for the book of Natalia Ginsburg, um, Lessico Familiare, uh, we'll, we will give away the, the English version, so it's called Family Lexicon. Um, and yes, I just would like to inform you that this presentation is being recorded and enjoy the presentation. Pieranna, I will give the floor to you. I had to unmute myself and also to remind myself to speak English. Last time, <laughs> I wanted to thank Tiziana and Anna Olivero for their help in preparing this, uh, in supporting this pre program and uh, preparing this slides. In particular, Tiziana put a lot of her artistic skills in helping me, but I started in Italian. So probably nobody heard me thanking them. So I had to do it again. So we chose this, first of all, thank you and welcome to everybody uh, who is uh, here. Um, I'm very happy to talk about this writer in general about Italian writer. But this writer is in many ways particularly close to me. Even if I have to say I'm not an expert at all in her work, but some of her works have, uh, they really speak to me. And maybe during the presentation, we'll give you some hints of why I now believe that uh, Natalia Ginsburg's work is, um, is particular. Um, we have chosen this title and we were concerned that it was too pessimistic. And so I want to reassure you for once, um, we will try to focus uh, on the legacy that these writers have left for us. And on the other side, though, I want to say in many ways, it is a title that is correct. Huh. You know what? Oh, good. I was going to ask for your help, Tiziana. 
in the case of Natalia Ginsburg, it's true that um, her life was particularly difficult. It wasn't easy. And uh, she had to overcome several uh, obstacles and challenges. Um, I like this picture of her. She's probably in her 60s here, not uh, young anymore. I'm trying to make it. But, and, and there are some characteristics in the picture that I think are worth uh, stressing. She's an Italian, and so as you can see, she's smoking. And I find that pretty interesting for a, you know, for a picture that would be used to advertise her work. Um, there are also plenty of pictures of her with cats. So if you're a cat lover, you must know that she enjoyed that. Um, I uh, think it's important to remember the places or the geography of her life. Um, she was born in Palermo, which of course is in Sicily, uh, but she did not work or, or spend much time in the, in the south. Um, the, the cities of her life were Turin, where she went with her family very early in life, and then she spent quite a bit of time in Milano and Rome um, because she, as we will see a little bit later, she worked in the publisher, in the, um, the publishing house Einaudi, whose major offices were exactly in Milan and Roma. The small town of Pizzoli is in this map because she spent um, three important years of her life, probably uh, some of the, the most important years of her life. It's a small town in Abruzzo, and that is where her husband was sent in what it was called internal um, exile or confino. The word in Italian is confino. And she lived there uh, with him uh, and she, she took her children there as well. Now, this is her, we try to capture some of the most important events in her life in this timeline. So she was born in 1916, as you can see. She um, went to the high school and uh, at the university later on in Turin. Um, we chose, I chose to put 1921 as an important year because that was the year in which both the communist and the fascist parties started. And it's interesting to point out, to remember that they were both both originated from a socialist, a group of socialist thinkers. And that was the period in which those ideas were circulating in Italy, Northern Italy, in particular in Milan. A very important date, 1938, is the date in which the racial laws in Italy were enforced. And um, I, I think it's uh, striking how all of this is still so clear in the memory uh, of Italians. I, when I was preparing this, I received in my email a message from the University of Milan, uh, La Bicocca, uh, where they were organizing a day of remembrance, of remembering the racial laws, because they started the 11 of November of 1938. And um, there is a beautiful document, there are beautiful documents from the archives in, this, uh, in the website of this conference. And you can see that the, the law established, it's in capital, letters that all teachers, all university professors who were Jewish were forbidden from teaching. So they were sent away or dismissed. And this was um, 
a, an event that affected very deeply Natalia Ginsburg, not only because her father was forbidden for teaching, but also her um, husband, um, where both of them dismissed. And we'll come back talking about that. In the break between 38 and 50, a lot happens in her life. You see the picture uh, at the top right with Natalia and Leone Ginsburg, her husband, of whom I will speak a lot in the next uh, slides. That is probably a picture around the time of their wedding. The picture below it to the left is a picture of her in the offices of Einaudi, the publisher, and the man to her right is Pier Paolo Pasolini, the director, who actually asked her to act in one of his movies, in Vangelo Secondo San Matteo, I believe, where she acted as Magdalene. And the gentleman to her left is Giorgio Bassani, a writer of Jewish uh, origin too. Um, it might be, you may remember it, The Garden of Finzi Contini, who, which is a book he wrote, a very interesting one. Um, after Leone passed, um, she uh, was alone for, a ver for, for six years, as we will see. But she did marry again in 1950, and the man she married, Gabriele Baldini, was an um, expert a, a scholar of English literature. And we will talk about him a little bit more. In uh, 1983, she was elected to the Camera, <clears throat> the Camera dei Deputati, the House of Representatives in Italy, and she was elected as independent for the left. And I particularly like the last picture I put there, where she's shaking hands with Sandro Pertini. Sandro Pertini was a president of the Republic in the uh, 80s, and he was loved, I think, dearly. He was one of the most popular presidents we had. He had been very active in the resistance and the liberation of Italy from the fascists. And as you can see, they are shaking hands very cordially here. I will talk about him again a little bit later. She died in 1991 in Rome when she was 75 years old. OK, I want to spend a little time to talk about her parents because well, because they are important in her life, but also uh, they are very important for one of the books that I chose to talk about. Her father, Giuseppe Levi, was an histologist, so he studied the human tissues and he taught anatomy. Uh, he was of Jewish origin, his family originally from Trieste, but what's so remarkable about him and you will see why even more when I'll talk about him again in connection to the uh, family lexicon. Um, he taught three Nobel Prizes. And uh, you can see on the slide the names, Salvatore Luria, Renato Dulbeco, and Rita Levi Montalcini. Now, as we know, there are many Nobel Prizes. Women, all of them are um, were uh, um, awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine, but he was a wonderful mentor for his students. Some of the testimonies, and clearly he was a man who was able to mentor women scientists and not only men. He was fiercely anti-fascist. The whole family was not religious. Lydia was a Catholic, but... Um, as we will see, her contribution to the family atmosphere was in terms of great humor and love for music and uh, a, a very cheerful um, 
counterpart to Giuseppe or Beppino, like she used to call him. Uh, you see at the end the name of all the children, and I will talk more about some of them. Um, Natalia, as I mentioned, married Leo, uh, Leona Ginsburg, and uh, um, I decided to give you a, a selection of different uh, pictures to um, puntualize or to focus on different moments in his life. Um, he was born in Odessa, so he was of Russian originally, um, and he came to Italy and he wanted to become, he became an Italian citizen. And the first picture on the top is a picture which I think is also mentioned later on in Natalia's writing, uh, when he was clearly very young. That is something extremely young and delicate about the first picture. The second one on the left under it is the picture that was taken when he was arrested for the first time. He was arrested. Um, for doing work uh, of propaganda against the Nazis. The small little picture on the right is the picture again of him with Natalia. We don't know if it is at the wedding or right after, but uh, in their uh, few years of marriage. And the last image you see, which is in Italian, is a plaque that was put in Pizzoli, I believe, to commemorate uh, his, uh, his life, as you can see, born in Odessa in 1909 and uh, died in Rome in 19, and he should be 44. Um, the, the story or the life of Leone Ginsburg has not been forgotten in Italy. Uh, and I wanted to give you a, an example to understand this. This is um, a high school, which in collaboration with an Audi publishing and the Jewish community of Turin uh, organized a day of remembrance with different uh, uh, speakers to remember his life. And, um, he was one of the first editors of the Einaudi publishing. And this painting, it drove me crazy in these days when I was trying to find both the author and the title. I think the title has to do with his uh, hands, the red hands, the mani rosse. But to this day, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find uh, uh, the author. So. Um, Leone um, died in prison, and we, uh, we read how Natalia uh, presents his uh, talks about uh, his death. Uh, but he was able to write um, a letter, a last letter, probably the day before he died, to his wife. And he did die the 5th of February. So, here, the school is celebrating his, uh, um, remembering him exactly on the day in which he died. And this letter is, um, it's very uh, moving, I think. And as far as I know, I haven't found the evidence that it has been translated in English. So I will read my own translation to you. Every time I hope this might not be the last letter I write to you. My desire is that you may normalize as soon as it is possible your life, that you work and write and be useful to others. These advices may seem easy and irritating, but they are the fruit of my love and my sense of responsibility. By means of your artistic creation, you will get rid of the too many tears that burden you. By means of your social activities, you will be close to other people, having the children 
will mean for you to have a great source of strength. And this is toward the end. Don't worry too much about me. Imagine that I am a prisoner of war. There are so many of those, especially in this war. And in the greatest majority of cases, they will come back. Let us hope that we are in the greatest majority. Right, Natalia? Be brave, Leone. So this was actually the last letter, although he clearly didn't know that it was going to be. Um, I want to read for you, uh, or I want you to read actually, how Natalia talks about the trauma um, that one is left with. And I'll let you read it in English and then I will read you her text in Italian. So here is a her text. C'è qualcosa di cui non si guarisce e passeranno gli anni, ma non guariremo mai. È inutile credere che possiamo guarire di vent'anni come quelli che abbiamo passato. Chi di noi è stato un perseguitato non ritroverà mai più la pace. Mi pare sempre che un giorno o l'altro dovremo di nuovo alzarci di notte e scappare e lasciare tutto dietro a noi, stanze quiete e lettere e ricordi e indumenti. She also reflect how often when we live, we don't realize that uh, maybe a part of our life was the best part of it. And this passage that we will be um, reading is a passage that comes from a short essay um, called Winter in Abruzzo um, that is inserted in that book of essays entitled The Little Virtues, which I will, call, um, I will talk more about at the end because it is one of the two texts that I wanna focus on. So I'll let you read the English once again and then I'll read the Italian. Mio marito morì a Roma nelle carceri di Regina Celi, pochi mesi dopo che avevamo lasciato il paese. Davanti all'orrore della sua morte solitaria, davanti alle angosciose alternative che precedettero la sua morte, io mi chiedo se questo è accaduto a noi, che compravamo gli aranci da girò e andavamo a passeggio nella neve. Allora io avevo fede in un avvenire facile e lieto, ricco di desideri appagati, di esperienze e di comuni imprese. Ma era quello il tempo migliore della mia vita. E solo adesso che mi è sfuggito per sempre. Solo adesso lo so. This is the only, the only uh, notice that she gives to her husband. Uh, death in the whole um, story about her being uh, at this exile, internal exile. And so I wanted to give it to you as an example of what uh, many critics characterize as the terseness of her prose. Um, I think her writing is particularly um, apt to being translated exactly because in many ways it's extremely simple. It's not a complicated Italian. Um, it took about six years for um, uh, Natalia to get married again. 
And as I mentioned before, she married Gabriele Baldini. I like to give you as a sort of a contrast with Leone, uh, her presentation of her second husband is pretty hilarious in many ways. It's humorous. It's a litany of differences. And to me, this is so much a symbol, an example of many relationships between partners. So here you have the, the contrast. He always feels a hot. I always feel cold. He speaks several languages well. I do not speak any well. He has an excellent sense of direction. I have none at all. He loves the theater, painting, music, especially music. I do not understand music at all. And I get bored at the theater. I love and understand one thing in the world and that is poetry. He loves traveling. I would like to stay home at home at all, all the time and never move. So um, I wanted to contrapose the, in a sense, terse and dramatic recounting of uh, her first art and that with uh, her portrayal of her second husband and second relationship. Um, Natalia Ginsburg had a lot of humor in her writing, humor and irony. Um, her writing are getting a lot of attention. I give you here only three examples of very recent articles that have been recent, as you can see, um, that have been published. I uh, have more. Uh, if you just put Natalia Ginsburg on Google and look for different articles, uh, you will find many. I find very interesting that uh, Elena Ferrante's success has brought many critics and readers to look back at Ginsburg. As you can see, one of the articles here is comparing the two. So, or, or, or pointing out um, both of them, let's say. Um, Natalia Ginsburg wrote a lot. This is a list. I, I put only the Italian titles, but I have to tell you that I have been translated. I would say most all of them, maybe Familia uh, might not have been. And certainly the not is the first one she had to publish with a pen name because it was published under the fascist era and she couldn't use a um, Jewish name. So she published under Alessandra Tonin Parte. All the others are in her name, Ginsburg. She never abandoned the name, uh, Leone's name. Estato Così was tra translated as the dry heart uh, it's a striking book. Um, I want to say just briefly, um, I just listened today to a conference that was organized in New York. Tiziana was kind enough to let me know at the Ferilli Merrimont uh, house in New York. And um, there was a beautiful panel of very uh, distinguished experts on uh, her work. And they were mentioning the fact that translation is such a great um, and important activity in uh, Italy. 55% of what is published is in translation from other languages. And um, that conference was three years ago, so 2017, but they were mentioning 55% in Italy and 3% in the United States and England. So um, translations are not the biggest part or a great part of what's published in this country. Moreover, only 0.6% are women. And so I thought it's, it's really interesting. It's a, in a sense an honor, the fact that Natalia Ginsburg work uh, has been broadly translated, but also stresses the need to have more translation. 
Okay, let's go back a minute to talk about her style, because I mentioned before that she is probably translated more than other Italian writer, for example, as Samorante or, um, you know, Elena Ferrante too, has a writing style that uh, seems to be, have to be translated effectively. As we saw Sibylla Le Ramon's work um, last month, it's not so easy. But anyway, why her style is so uh, plain or simple or terse? And here we have a humorous explanation of why. And I'd like you to read it. So there is a family uh, theme here um, to which she ascribes the simplicity and straightforwardness of her, um, of her style. The fact that she was the youngest and they were five kids, two parents, a very chatty mother. Uh, it was important for her to be able to say what she had to say with a minimum number of uh, uh, words. Um, but there is also a lot more to say. She was a very private person. In this uh, conference, as I mentioned to you, talking about translation and her work, um, they were stressing over and over how in Family Lexicon, which is one of the books we will talk about pretty soon, she is never present in the, or at least in the author preface to that book, she says, this is not my story. Uh, this is a story of my family. And later on, um, she had a collection of interviews uh, with the RAI, Radio um, Televisione Italiana, and that uh, those interviews have been collected in a um, book entitled, It is Hard to Talk About One's Yourself. And uh, it's, so that is a collection of translations of her interviews. And in those interviews, she clearly say that um, it was very hard for her to talk about personal matters. And so I wanted to give you another beautiful passage this comes from uh, Lessico Familiare. It's the only passage in which she talks about uh, her husband's death. So in the book, she will mention pretty much in the middle of it that she got married with Leone. Um, and then she never mentions him again until this passage. So I'd like you read it. And then I will read it in Italian. L'editore aveva appeso alla parete, nella sua stanza, un ritrattino di Leone, col capo un pochino, gli occhiali bassi sul naso, la folta capigliatura nera, la profonda fossetta sulla guancia, la mano femminea. Leone era morto in carcere nel braccio tedesco di Regina Celi a Roma, durante l'occupazione tedesca, un gelido febbraio. This is a, a passage that um, tells you how uh, she remembers him clearly with deep love. And I mentioned before that maybe that more feminine picture of Leone is the one she's alluding to here. And uh, but these are the only words she um, devotes to that. Uh, so this is a quote from a much more recent word, five years before her death. And she says, when I write something, I usually think it is very important and that I am a very fine writer. She writes in an essay for the New York Times book review. 
But there is one corner of my mind in which I know very well what I am, which is a small, very small writer. So she was a particularly modest writer. This, um, I want to now spend the rest of the time we have, which I think is not much, um, discussing with you and reading with you some passages from uh, two works mainly, Family Lexicon, um, which has been translated in different ways. The first time it was family saying, then it was the way we speak or the way we talk, and then finally Family Lexicon. Uh, which I think is the best translation. And in the preface, uh, she says, the places, people, and events in this book are real. I haven't invented a thing. And each time I found myself slipping into my long held habits as a novelist and made something up, I was quickly compelled to destroy the invention. So. The, the beautiful idea of the family lexicon is to capture in a work uh, the language that a family shares. One of her uh, critics or uh, uh, one of the scholars who writes about her, Cynthia Zaring, in, a, in the New York article that I mentioned before, says, um, that this is something that happened not only in families, but even in nations, that the meaning of our jokes and pun and stories, George Washington and the cherry tree, the truth we all to be self-evident, in quote, the eminent Senor Lipman, that time mother danced on the table, are what makes us who and what we are. So this is the mm, intuition or the, um, the motivation between uh, her writing the family lexicon. And I think this is an, a, a very important quote that we can read together. My parents had five children. We now live in different cities, some of us in foreign countries, and we don't write to each other often. When we do meet up, we can be indifferent or distracted. But for us, it takes just one word. It takes one word, one sentence, one of the old ones from our childhood, heard and repeated countless times. And we immediately fall back into our old relationships, our childhood, our youth, all inextricably linked to those words and phrases. If my siblings and I were to find ourselves in a dark cave or among millions of people, just one of these words, sorry, of these phrases or words would immediately allow us to recognize each other. I, I think th there is something so universal in this, universal, common to families, common to schools, common to classes in my teaching. And I think she has captured it beautifully. So in family lexicon, I just want to come back to talk briefly about the family. Are we doing OK, Tiziana, for time? Yes, we're still doing OK. It's 6.41. So Thank you. Sometime. Okay, the main character of the book are the father and the mother. Now, the father in the book appears to be irascible, critical of the children. In one translation, he calls them jackasses. In the most recent translation, which is done by Jenny McPhee, he does use the N word and. Um, uh, I, I've seen this translator talking about how do you deal with this? Why would Natalia Ginsburg use that word? How do we react, uh, contemporary reader, in particular contemporary English reader, to the N word 
in a translation. And I think this um, translator had two uh, ways of dealing with it. She said we could, you know, say, well, it wasn't really racism in her father's um, speech because, you know, they might have used it, it might have used, uh, been a dialect, it wasn't really racist. The other way, which I find, she finds more um, interesting and, and better, and, and I agree with her, is to say Natalia represented her father for what he really was. Um, he was a, a tough man on his children. He would take them uh, to the mountains at four o'clock in the morning. His wife called that the devil's idea of fun for his children. So Natalia represented that in a sense, uh, in some ways without charity, but she also represent him as a caring father who walk up in the middle of the night and walk up his wife talking about his children. So the portrayal is, is complete in many ways. And so as this translator was saying, there was racism, in many ways there was sexism in that book because the women are always presented as in some ways second rate. Um, another interesting interpretation of that book um, points out that in every book, there are two stories. The one that is being told and the one that underlines it. And here what underlines it is the anti-fascism of the whole family. And so I had listed here different ways in which uh, this um, second story appear. Giuseppe Levi had to uh, drop his um, tenure job in Turin, ended up in Belgium, where he was able to continue his research. Uh, uh, one of Natalia's uh, brother was almost caught when he was bringing in anti-fascist propaganda, and he saved himself by diving in the river and swimming to Switzerland. <laughs> Uh, of course, Leona's death, and having a harbor socialists like Turati and Anna Kulisha. Okay, I have three, unfortunately not very short, uh, quotes from the second book that I have chosen for you, um, which is The Little Virtues. So this is, I will not read them, but I, I will give you the reasons why I chose them. This one is to me a, 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 an amazing short essay in which she talks about the fact that adults and artists sometimes don't care about how they look and how they go around. You may go around, you know, with tattle uh, clothes and worn out shoes and you feel perfectly fine but you don't want your children to go around with broken or worn out shoes. And here she explains why toward the end. And she says, maybe because in order to be able to be strong and, and, uh, and not care about appearances, you need to have had a childhood in which you did have good shoes to work on. So that's the main idea. It's a very, uh, interesting and ironic short essay. And then uh, the last two uh, passages I'm giving you, the last two slides, are all passages from the title essay that gives the title to the collection. And although this the book is entitled The Piccoli Virtu, um, she doesn't praise the piccoli, the little virtue. She actually says that we shouldn't uh, teach our children the little virtues. So uh, I just want to focus on the first paragraph. Not thrift, but generosity and an indifference to money. Not caution, but courage and a contempt for danger. Not shrewdness, but frankness 
and a love of truth, not tact, but love for one's neighbor and self-denial, not a desire for success, but a desire to be and to know. Um, the last slide I'm going to show you, it's a slide where she talks about um, what we should teach our children and what she thinks is crucial is to always teach them the love for life and to be present in our children's life. But uh, as she says in the third point, we should always be available and present in the next room, but not in the same room in which they live. Just as much as they should like us, but not too much. They should never be tempted to be identical to us. And then I want to read the last word. The one real chance we have of giving them some kind of a help in their search for a vocation, to have a vocation ourselves, to know it, to love it, and serve it passionately, because love of life begets a love of life. So what she's saying here is that it, it's important that we are committed and devoted to a vocation. And I find that in all their difference, this is something that both Natalia and Sibylla Leramo had in common, the a great love and committed, commitment to their writing. Thank you for li listening to me. Thank you, Pirana, thank you so much. Um, we will now start the, the Q&A, so we'll do um, about 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers. Uh, so you can either type directly your questions in the chat or, and I see there are already a few questions, so I'll, I'll start with, we can start with those questions. Um, Pierana, oh. if, if you like, we can stop the, sh the screen sharing. Yes, could you please? I seem to have trouble doing it. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Here I am. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Um, so uh, we have a first question. George, would you, li would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, and I'd like to thank you for the wonderful presentation. It was really interesting. Thank you. History. Um, I, I would like to know a little bit more um, about her time during the war and whether she herself was perse persecuted during the war, whether she maybe had to flee to Switzerland during some of that time. Could you talk about that a little bit? Of course. Thank you. Uh, you try and try to um, pack as much information as possible, but I think I really failed to give you an idea what happened to her during the war. So her family, as I said, was a family of committed anti-fascists. So they had a lot of uh, socialists and activists in their family. I think everyone in their family was affected by fascism. Of course, her dad was a lost his job as as a researcher and uh, for her, she was not able to uh, publish, as I mentioned before, her first work in, um, with her own name. But then what happened to her was that in 38, exactly when those laws came into effect, she married Leon Ginsburg and in 19, uh, after having already gone to prison, he, in 1940, he was sent to Confino. And they already had two children and she was pregnant of their third one. And so she followed him. And so she lived in, um, in Confino with her husband until um, 1943, when actually Mussolini's government fell. The interesting thing there is the drama and the 
comedy together. So Leone, at the, at the end of the summer, Leone went back to Rome and he started to doing the same type of activities he was doing before, which was propaganda. And that's why he was arrested in the printing shop where he was preparing this material. But she was left in Pizzoli and the comedy was in the fact I was planning to read this for you. It's not very long. And so it's from Lessico Familiare. And I read from the translation. But she said, I left the village on the 1st of November. I had received a letter from Leone brought to me by hand by someone who came from Rome. In it, he told me to leave the village immediately because it was difficult to hide there and the Germans would identify and deport us. The other internees were by now hiding in places scattered about the countryside or in nearby towns. Now the people of the village came to my rescue. They all coordinated among themselves and they helped me. The owner of the hotel who had the Germans occupying her few rooms, Germans sitting in the kitchen around the fire where so often we, we had sat quietly. She told the soldiers that I was a relative of hers, a refugee from Naples, that I had lost my papers during the air raids and that I had to get to Rome. The German, German trucks went to Rome every day. So one morning I climbed onto one of those trucks and the villagers came to kiss my children whom they had watched grow up goodbye. So the Germans, as it's told in the story, the Germans took her to Rome. So she got to Rome with the Nazis. And, but of course, that's where, uh, you know, the Nazi, that's where they capture her husband um, in November 19, uh, 1944. Um, I had a testimony, an interesting one, where Sandro Pettini, the same one who became president, actually saw Leone the night before he died, the 4th of February, which was after his last interrogation. And he told him that he was uh, hoping that in the future we will remember to separate um, the German people from the Nazis. So she was deeply affected by that. And then um, after that, I think after the death of Nazism uh, and, and fascism, I did not have a sense that she was affected anymore. Did I answer part of your question, George? Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. <laughs> Thank you for the great question, George. We have another question from Gordon. Gordon, would you like to unmute and, and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, a wonderful presentation, very informative. Um, actually, three simple questions. Number one, uh, did uh, uh, Natalia write only in Italian? I know she had said that uh, she wasn't very good with uh, any languages, but only in Italian? Yes. Okay. I think. <laughs> okay. For what I know, yes. Yeah. And uh, Le Piccole, I, I misspelled. Le Piccole uh, Virtu um, uh, has been translated into English, I assume? Yes. Yes. It's The Little Virtues. And I'm so glad that it is. Ah. Because I would start from there. It's a, it's a jewel. Okay. okay. And then the last question, I didn't write it out, but... Um, and you may have mentioned this and I missed it, but uh, so Ginsburg was her last name from her first marriage and she remarried, but kept the name Ginsburg. She never changed that name, is that correct? Okay. No, no. And I guess uh, Gabriele Baldini, the one that was always hot and loved music, didn't yeah. mind. Uh, <laughs> they had, uh, 
they had a long marriage. He died in 1969. Mm. They were very unlucky as parents. They had two children and Andrea, uh, it was Andrea. No, sorry, don't quote me on the name, but the first child died after a year and the second child whose name was Susanna was born with a severe disability and Natalia took care of her until her death. Oh, okay. So, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Thank you, Gordon. Ella, would you like to ask your question? Very interesting question regarding um, uh, Natalia Gingur's uh, plays. Please go ahead. You know, I, I just, uh, I know she wrote plays and I was just wondering if her plays are uh, being staged in Italy right now or are they forgotten? Good, that was something, I mean, I put too much and so I didn't say everything, but in my slides where I have all the work, the second column starts with the, with the plays and in particular, Teo Sposato per Allegria, so I, I married you for the fun of it, was extremely successful and um, she wrote some of her plays for particular actors and or actresses, actors. Um, they were very successful. I have no idea if they are still um, staged. I doubt that very much. But uh, there is a continuous revival of her work. I mean, the fact itself that she keeps being translated, right? One of the comments that some of the translators at this conference were making was that it's not unusual that a, a work is translated and retranslated, like we saw for Sibylla Aleramo. Her first translation was too literal and boring. The second one was too political. It was perfect for the 70s, but it wasn't right for the 90s anymore. So there was the need for a new translation. And we had a translation of Una Donna that came out last year. And the same is happening for Natalia Ginsburg. The family lexicon has been translated again very recently, two years ago. So maybe for the place too, there needs to be more um, translations for them to be used again. Thank you. Thank you for the question, very good. Thank you. Um, and then Suzanne, hi Suzanne. Um, you are mentioning the book by Caroline Moorehead. A House in the Mountains. Do you want to say a few words about that book? Well, it has been very difficult for me to find uh, in English uh, and also to be here in Colorado trying to do research for this book I'm working on now. And uh, I discovered this book by Carolyn Moorhead, which came out. She's a, a British author. She has written extensively about the resistance in Europe. And uh, I ran across the book, which was published just this last year. And it has been a gold mine for me. And I recommend to anybody that wants to learn more about, about Nat uh, Natalia and, and uh, Leone and all the other partisans that they were with uh, to read this book. It, it reads like a, a novel, but it's a nonfiction. Her, all of her work is very good. Thank you. Can you put in the chat maybe the name of the I book? Did. The I did, I did. Oh, yes, yes. It's, in yes. The, it's in the chat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for your oh, lecture. Thanks. It was wonderful. Yeah, I know I want to read some biographies of her now. Uh, you know, literature is not, was not my field. So <laughs> I'm, I'm learning to look for that one. Look for that one. I will. Thank you. Grazie, Suzanne. Um, Christina, would you like to ask your question regarding La Strada che va in città? Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, thanks. I'm trying to write down that author's name since I'm very interested in what happened during the war. So my question is about, so I know that 
um, she rolled La Strada Que Va in Chita during that occupation while she was in that little town. And I didn't know she had three children, or <laughs> two and one on the way. How did she do that? Yeah, well, in this book, <laughs> Piccole Virtu, she talks about uh, Il Mio Mestiere. Actually, it's called My Vocation. But one of the translations said a better um, title would be My Craft. And in some way, she doesn't talk practically about how she wrote, but she um, describes the ups and downs of her relationship with her writing and her desire to write. And you know, she has some passages. I wish now I had marked that. Um, she says very striking things. She says striking things about how happiness or unhappiness affected her writing, but also how, and you, after the death of, of Leone, I think in a sense there was a part of her that wanted to never write again. But then in that uh, particular essay, she says it just comes back you have to write, right? If, if that's your vocation, it's something that will come back and will urge you to go back to it. And of course, that was a her, in many ways, a her salvation. Most of her writing comes after uh, 1947. And um, if you think about the letter that Leona writes to her right before dying, he said, your art will save you. Uh, the children will give you strength, but your art will help you. And uh, so that essay in particular for me is one way to understand how she was doing that. Um, I am not saying more about La Strada, the Kvain Chita. I have all her books here, but I did focus on two only because I don't think I could talk about many more. Um, but I, I, I'm sure that, it, you know, I want to read it too. I did not. I focus on Lesco Familiare and on the little virtues. Thank you, though. Thank you. Yeah, it's short, so <clears throat> I read it with a group in Italian. Uh, so. Yeah. Good. I think you will find the essay is very, uh, so you read it in Italian? Uh, slowly, yeah. <laughs> good for you, Christina. That is wonderful. That is really good. Yeah. And before I move, thank you for the question, um, Amy. Uh, before I move to the next question, um, the, the play Ti ho sposato per allegria uh, was played in a theater in, in Turin in 2016. Oh, good. Good. Thank um, you, Tiziana. Well, thank you, Anna, for the information. <laughs> yes. This um, is teamwork. <laughs> yeah, good teamwork. Um, so we, we have another question um, from Amy. Sorry, Christina, I, 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 I said uh, Amy before, but um, so Amy, would you like to unmute and ask your question regarding um, the difference between Ferrante's writing and Ginsburg yeah. writing? So thank you so much for giving this talk. It was really wonderful and I really enjoyed it so much. So thank you for your time. I just finished yeah. Ferrante's uh, Neapolitan series, and um, I noticed that one of the articles um, that had a, a review or a quote with it on one of your slides compared Ferrante, if she was a friend, or he or she was a friend, that Ginsburg was a mentor, and I'm just wondering how you would compare their, their writing styles and, and how they write. Oh, yeah. I can't think of anything more different in many ways. I read the four Neapolitan novels, and I read them all together. Um, and then I decided, at least for now, not to read any more of Ferrante. I enjoyed it. But I think she is a great storytelling. I really think her strength, in, it's in the story and in keeping the, um, 
the reader with her. Um, Natalia Ginsburg is a storyteller in some ways. Um, family lexicon, some critics said, reads like a gossip book because she has this little story about all this character. I mean, it is. Um, but at the same time, it has this detachment, you know, and that's what's so intriguing and so puzzling about the book because it's her family, but in a way she is not in it. And she says that from the beginning, this is not my story. This is the story of my family. Um, and I think Elena Ferrante always writes as, um, as somebody who is in the story, not only because she uses the first person, but because she is so intensely, intensely passionate or um, emotional in some ways. There are emotions there. There is anger, there is pain. I mean, there is a thread of emotion. While with Ginsburg, the emotions are yours and hers are not, they are not described in a sense. She, I'm not saying she's cold or, um, you know, well, detached a little bit, but she's, she's very different from Ferrante. So we could talk a lot about it. I wanted to add one thing that uh, to me uh, was very important. I told you before why this writer is dear to me. And in particular, if you read the, the Little Virtues, I think uh, she was a writer, but she was a philosopher too. She was definitely a woman that was thinking, a person who was thinking about ethical issues. Those pages that I wasn't able to spend enough time on, in which I give you quotes from uh, her work, from the people of you too, when she talks about what we should teach the children. There is really a lot of uh, moral and ethical question. That's why I think that journalist, Amy, says, Elena Ferrante could be your friend. You know, you can talk with a friend about emotion and you are sympathetic and they are sympathetic to you. But Natalia Ginsburg is a mentor. She is teaching you mm -hmm. what you should be doing what we all should be doing. And so there is a texture in her that I find to be ethical, really a, a very important ethical level. Wonderful. So thanks, thanks for that question. It's really something I'm thinking about myself. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for your question. Um, I know we're going over time, but I, I would, I would like if Pierana, if it's okay for you as well, to take one more question. Um, Very happy. It's a question from Stefan. Stefan, would you like to yeah. unmute him and ask your question? Sure. Okay. Hi, great talk. Hi, Keisha. I was wondering um, what kind of education, if you know, that she received, and do you think that affected her career, her writing at all? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. So. Um, just like Sibylla Leramo in the first years of the, her life, um, they didn't go to regular school. Sibylla Leramo, unfortunately, didn't study after, she didn't go to regular school after she was 12. Natalia was tutor at home, and remember, she was middle upper class, so um, she, she was able to have an education. But then she went to Liceo and she went to Liceo Classico. So the best type, best, sorry, that sounds very uh, condescending, but there is in Italy this idea that the Liceo Classico is the best school to go to. And where you study Greek, you study Latin, etc. And then she did start university. But what I thought was very interesting, she quit. She just didn't want to continue studying. And uh, in a sense, she did not have any other formal education. 
did that affect the uh, writing? Well, perhaps, perhaps part of the simplicity of her prose is due to the fact that she never tried artful, um, you know, trying to sound more intellectual than she was. She was a very southern and serious person. I mean, people who actually had the interviews said she was even stern. <laughs> and in many ways, you know, she uses a limited language, but very effectively. She had, her father was a scientist. That was in common with Sibylla Le Ramon too. Her father was an engineer and Natalia's father was um, a scientist. So maybe that part of the education they received from their parents. Um, but I think it might have affected her. I'm saying this after having defended the education all my life, as you know. <laughs> maybe it helped her writing in, in a way. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have a last question for Tirana? Thank you for being such a wonderful audience and for the great question. And if you have more questions, you can email me if you want. I think I mentioned Tiziana will put the recording on YouTube. And there you can see my slides, but I'll be happy to send you any, um, you know, uh, bibliography I might have. Although I think there are other people who can help us with that. Well, Pierana, I really want to thank you. Um, I love the the passion with which you you you, you share the 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 lives and and works of of these Italian authors with us. Um, I really, really appreciate that. And I want to share that it's a real pleasure to work with you on these events. Every time we have a, we work together, I really love it. It's really uh, always a great pleasure. And also thank you, thank you to everyone for participating to this presentation. I agree with all your comments that this was a fascinating um, presentation. And before we end, um, uh the, the the presentation i will draw the winner of the the book that we're gonna give away um so family lexicon uh so i'll use my innocent hand good luck everybody <laughs> i'm not looking <laughs> all right george heimpel oh good <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. it. Congratulations. It's going to be a drawing. <laughs> That's great news. There you go. Grazie mille. With pleasure. Good luck. <laughs> so thank you again, everyone, you. and hope you will join thank us you. for the next appointment. Um, we will be talking um, about uh, Dacia Maraini. So, yeah, stay tuned and uh, a great night to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ciao. Arrivederci. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, Stefano.